Visual Economic Community, if I were to ask you one thing that the EU spends most of its budget on, what would you think the answer would be? Some of you might be thinking about the aid given to less developed member countries such as Bulgaria or Romania. Others might think that most of the money goes to large investment projects like the Next Generation Funds. Or, if you are more Eurosceptical, you might think that the biggest item on spending goes to pay the salaries of politicians, civil servants and bureaucrats. Well, if you answered any of these things, I am sorry, but you are wrong. Surprising as it might seem, the largest item, the item that swallows 24% of the entire EU budget is the CAP, or Common Agricultural Policy, which is basically a supercluster of subsidies for the agricultural economy. Yes, that's right. You could say that the European Union as a whole is a political mega conglomerate that is largely dedicated to subsidizing the primary sector. In fact, at the time of its conception in 1962, the Common Agricultural Policy program devoured up to 80% of the entire budget of the European economic community. You see, at that time, the European continent was still divided between the Eastern and Western blocks. Regions such as Ukraine, which today is considered the breadbasket of Europe, were not only much less productive than today, but also traded much less with the Western bloc. And if we add to all this the fact that at the time, the European economy was still damaged by the Second World War, then we are left with a European economic community that was very dependent on importing food from abroad in order to survive. As you can imagine, this left it in a geostrategically weak position in regards to the rest of the world. Its food supply was anything but stable and prices could skyrocket at any moment. Clearly, this was a problem that Europe had to solve, so governments decided to get their act together and start throwing lots and lots of money into the European agricultural sector. Since then, both wages and the European countryside's own corporate profits have been largely paid by the European macro government. To give you an idea, at present, around 25% of farm workers' income comes from this type of public aid. However, aid to the European agricultural sector has gone far beyond just subsidies. Since the creation of the European Economic community, the internal market has also been liberalized, eliminating tariffs between member countries so that they could trade easily with each other. Meanwhile, the European authorities did exactly the opposite, placing all kinds of obstacles in the way of agricultural products from other countries. And why? Why did Europe block the arrival of foreign products? Well, mainly for two reasons. The first is that foreign competition could weaken local companies. And the second is that too much foreign trade in the eyes of European politicians could create an undesirable dependence on foreign countries. Be that as it may, the question to be asked now is, did the European Union achieve its goal of boosting the European agricultural industry? Well, the truth is that yes, they did. An example of this can be seen on the screen right now. Since the creation of the European Economic Community, the production of foodstuffs such as wheat has skyrocketed. Of course, the CAP can't take all the credit from this. The 1960s also saw the so-called Green Revolution, which brought about a dramatic improvement in agricultural productivity due to the invention of better pesticides and the use of better seed varieties. In any case, the result was that food ceased to be a problem in Western Europe. In fact, production increased so much that politicians began to encourage its export to the international market. Europe went from being a region with food problems to being a major global exporting power. As a result of the success, the CAP, the Common Agricultural Policy, gradually lost influence and was reformed. In fact, the current CAP is very, very different from how it was first conceived. The question now then is, what does the CAP consist of today and is it still really necessary? The current CAP is based on two fundamental pillars. The first pillar is direct aid, which swallows up to 75% of the entire budget. Its main objective is simply to raise wages, to offer guaranteed purchases of chunks of the production and to give aid to young farmers farmers. By the way, young means up to 40 years old here in Europe. This pillar also subsidizes exports in order to sell abroad at competitive prices. Meanwhile, the second pillar focuses on the sustainable development of the rural world, in addition to providing other types of aid for the protection of natural areas, the protection of biodiversity, and the fight against climate change. Regarding the latter, to give you an idea, by law, 30% of the entire CAP budget within each country has to go to environmental activities. Even so, visual economic viewers, the truth is that despite this apparent success and all the fine words, the policy has been harshly criticized by politicians and economists alike. Many argue that the CAP, rather than providing assistance, could be providing a terrible disease for European productivity and European agriculture. And this is particularly worrying, given the enormous expenditure involved. However, is the CAP really 
necessary? Is so much agricultural aid justified? And what are the problems that so many critics have pointed out? Today on Visual Economic, we're going to tell you all about it. So let's get cracking. As mentioned earlier, the idea behind agricultural protectionism was, as its name indicates, to protect agricultural production from political ups and downs. However, that does come at a price. You see, at first glance, the total cost of the CAP for each European taxpayer is around about €120 Euros per year. But this figure only includes the direct cost of the subsidies. The problem is that protecting the common industry at the cost of blocking cheaper foreign products tends to increase the price of the shopping basket as well. If we add to the €120 Euros the increase in food prices between one thing and the other, the cost of the CAP amounts to about 530 euros per person, about 1.5 of the GDP of the entire region. But does all this sound a little bit Greek to you? Well, let's take a more concrete case. A report presented to the European Commission compared the price of food in the United Kingdom, when it was still within the CAP, to New Zealand. In theory, they are two countries with a very similar GDP per capita. However, the difference is that New Zealand carried out a very extensive liberalisation of its agricultural sector in the 1980s. Therefore, it stopped paying subsidies as CAP has continued to do. As you can see on the screen here, the results could not have been worse for European politics. With the data in hand, it does not seem that the CAP has made access to food much easier for European families. In fact, it almost seems to have achieved the opposite effect. Now, many will say that this comparison, Europe with New Zealand, is complicated. Perhaps Europe is, by nature, a difficult territory for this industry, or perhaps the CAP has been able to help improve productivity in spite of everything else. Even so, if we are talking about productivity, the truth is that we can't find very good news there either. I mean, check this out. Common agricultural productivity? When we look at the productivity of the agricultural sector in Europe, what we will see is that it has increased. However, it has done so at a much slower rate than the productivity of the rest of the economy. To give an example, in the last decade, agricultural productivity has increased by 6%, while the rest of the economy has increased by 24%. That's four times as much. For this reason, the added value of agriculture, in other words, the sector's contribution to GDP and therefore to the generation of wealth, has been stagnant for years. In fact, recently, it actually started to fall pretty sharply. That said, you might well be wondering, what is it that is dragging down the productivity of farming despite all the aid it receives? There are several explanations for this. For example, some farmers complain about environmental regulations and the prohibition of certain pesticides. In fact, between 2014 and 2019, the number of workers engaged in organic agriculture, which among other things does not use artificial pesticides, has increased from 250 to 330,000. And not surprisingly, this type of agriculture is much less productive. Sri Lankan farmers learn a lesson from the organic farming debacle. The lack of alternatives led to sharp drops in production, with rice and other crops declining. This, in turn, stoked a severe economic crisis, culminating in last year's default on $40 billion in foreign debt. Beyond this issue, the European Union is very restrictive on the use of genetically modified foods. Technically, they are legal, but the process of getting approval is so rigorous that by 2020, only 118 products had obtained a permit, of which only a dozen were intended for direct human consumption. In any case, perhaps the most relevant factor that explains the failure of agricultural productivity in Europe lies in the fact that, since 2003, CAP subsidies have been decoupled from production. For instance, a farmer receives a subsidy based on how much land he has under cultivation, but not on how much he produces. Of course, what this means is that the incentive of this policy is that farmers, instead of taking advantage of every last millimetre of land to produce, what they will do instead is extend their field, produce very little, and collect the subsidies anyway. Clearly, decoupling aid from production was productive suicide. Nevertheless, this decision was made for a rational reason. The fact is that the previous CAP policies, being so large and linked to production, led to the disproportionate overproduction of products that were not sold. The European Union's Butter Mountains are costing taxpayers £236 million. The European Commission yesterday pledged to buy 30,000 tonnes of butter this year from farmers in the 27 countries of the Union, as well as 109,000 tonnes of skimmed milk powder. Perhaps the problem of overproduction was due to the subsidies being excessive. The logical thing to do then would have been to cut them, but going against the subsidies would have meant many strikes and great political pressure on the authorities from the agricultural sector. 
sector, so politicians opted for the easy way out, decoupling subsidies from production and destroying productivity. However, the misaligned incentives of subsidies are far from being the only problem that might be weighing down European agriculture. And there is one factor that plays a very important role in all of this. We're talking about corruption. Corruption, particularly in Eastern Europe, is another major problem. You see, the CAP is designed to help particularly small and medium-sized landowners. In fact, large farms receive virtually no assistance at all. However, as the saying goes, the devil here is in the details. Since subsidies are granted according to the size of each farm, as long as you have many small plots of land dedicated to agricultural activities, you will be able to receive numerous subsidies. And if you only have large estates, well, don't worry then either. You can always divide it into smaller pieces that you need, and then you put each plot in the names of your cousins, and you are all set to live on the subsidies that you will get. With this scheme, it is not unusual to see news stories like this one. 29 September 2016, the Queen, Saudi aristocrats, and princes among recipients of farm subsidies. And if you thought we were finished, the truth is that we have left one of the most criticized issues for last. It is more than likely that the CAP is affecting developing countries very negatively. This is a phenomenon that could be occurring for two reasons. First of all, do you remember how the CAP subsidized exports? Thanks to this aid, Europe is able to sell its agricultural products abroad below the market price. I know what many of you might be thinking, but how can it hurt a poorer country if they are able to buy cheaper food? In the short term, it seems all positive. However, on this channel, we have already told you several times how giving away things to these types of countries could destroy their local industry. It creates an unfair competition to the industry of poor countries, and agriculture is no different. At the same time, the high tariffs on non-EU countries and the protection as I mentioned above, reduce the benefits of small and medium-sized producers in poor countries that are looking to trade with Europe. Fortunately, there have been relevant advances in this regard, and under the Everything But Arms law, the European Union has a free trade agreement with 49% of the least developed countries. Even so, countries as important as China and India, along with Latin American countries, are left out and depend on bilateral treaties that often do not go ahead. In any case, and having said all this, is there no way to support farm workers, protect the rural environment, and not burden the productivity of Europe and other countries? Is farming doomed to be a public money leech that destroys its own competitiveness? Well, the answer is no, there are alternatives. A possible change, but it's complicated. Let's be clear here. Being a developed country is not at odds with having a productive agricultural sector. There are cases of New Zealand, Singapore, Israel, or even the Netherlands, which itself is within the European Union. We have told you about all these cases both on this channel and on our sister channel, Visual Politic. Check it out. In general, these countries stand out for devoting a significant part of their aid to the agricultural sector in investment and R&D, rather than directly subsidizing workers in the sector. Nevertheless, Europe moving to a similar system would be very, very expensive. And we we are not only talking about the political cost, but above all, about the human cost of leaving an entire sector that depends to a large extent on agricultural workers without aid. Fortunately, there is one scheme that could lead to a painless transition. Tangerman bonds. Proposed by economist Stefan Tangerman, along with other economists specialized in the sector, this proposal would consist of changing the current direct aid for a kind of bonus. Under this system, the European Union would give a piece of paper to each aid recipient. This slip of paper would entitle him or her to receive annually a similar amount of money to what he or she is receiving now, and even a little more for a period of, say, 15 to 20 years. This would be done in compensation for the promises made, but making it very clear that at a certain time, most of the aid would be cut, especially those that have nothing to do with financing public goods. So then, what's the difference with the current model? Well, this bond could be sold to anyone else. In this way, bond recipients would have three options. Firstly, if their activity was already profitable without aid, they could continue with it as usual. Hence, there wouldn't be much change. However, the interesting thing comes into play when those workers and owners who are not productive enough continue without public subsidies. They could sell part of their bond and have the money all at once in order to invest in their project. For example, for buying more efficient machinery or for adapting their land to more profitable crops. It would be something like receiving the subsidies for the next 20 years all at once in order to be able to invest them and thus gain competitiveness. 
On the other hand, if the investment opportunity were not clear, workers could simply leave their jobs and look for a new job thanks to the buffer that the bonus would give them. The idea is that, thanks to their bonuses and the sale of their agricultural properties, they would have a large enough financial cushion to move and look for a new job with peace of mind, even taking time for training if they really needed it. In this way, we could make the transition to a freer and more competitive market without leaving the most vulnerable behind. But now it's over to you. Do you think that the CAP has benefited Europe in the long run? What other problems could its incentives produce? Would Tangerman bonds be a good way to transition to a more efficient system? You can leave me your answers in the comments below. And as always, don't forget that here on Visual Economic, we release new videos every week. So subscribe to this channel and hit the little bell button down there so you don't miss any of your updates. If you like this video, please like it so we know. All the best. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you next time.